location if the electricity switches off in the block. So we're just going to figure out whether that is the case and if we'll have to move or not. So just bear with us for a few minutes. Thanks. Uh, welcome to this Faculty of Technology open lecture series. Uh, it gives me great pleasure in introducing Tia. Uh, she is a researcher based at UCL and she is an economist by training and runs her own sustainable lifestyle and development consulting firm in London. Uh, in 2013, she received a Young Entrepreneur's Award for, at UCL for her work on energy efficiency in buildings. She has been a professional moderator and interviews world celebrities such as Bill Gates, uh, the Prime Minister of Bhutan and others. Uh, she has been invited to deliver three TEDx talks uh, on sustainable cities and future cities. And by the end of this month, she's going to San Francisco to del deliver one more talk. She's currently visiting CEPT uh, to research on smart cities. And also she'll be delivering a course on smart cities at the winter school happening in December. Her today's talk is based on comfort in buildings, uh, covering or focusing on post-occupancy evaluation energy efficiency and thermal comfort strategies with the case study of Abu Dhabi. Uh, after the talk, we'll have tea, so please join us for tea. And now welcome Tia. Hi, everyone. Um, it gives me a lot of pleasure to talk to you about a topic that I'm super passionate about. Comfort is something that we all have our own definitions of. So if I were to ask you, what does comfort mean to you? Can you give me a definition for what comfortable is? I'm here, yes, no, maybe. I'm gonna do the Indian nod, which means yes and no. <laughs> so comfort is often a sensation, but it's also a state of mind, and it is some characteristics that are defined by standards, by international organizations that define what is a steady state of comfort. My thesis looks very specifically at Abu Dhabi and the comfort that people experience inside the buildings in Abu Dhabi. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of an overview. We're looking at thermal comfort in the Middle East. I'll talk to you about a few of the concepts in the Gulf region, some of the big challenges that we have in the Gulf. I'll explain some of the urban forms, some of the architectural concepts of design that have really excited some people from vernacular architecture. And then I'm going to go into a little bit of detail of the energy use inside these buildings and to give you some parameters of feedback from the buildings that I've analyzed in my case study buildings. And finally, I'm gonna show you something that I did very particular to Abu Dhabi but also something that I think could revolutionize the way that we experience buildings. So without further ado, this is Abu Dhabi in the 1970s. On the right, you can see the fronds, the palm fronds that are utilized in the urban form. You've got a lady on the left that is moving around with her abaya on, and the temperature you're expecting is externally is about 35, between 35 and 50 degrees Celsius. This is what Abu Dhabi used to look like in the 1940s. It's a Qasr al Hosn, and it is the main palace of the leader of the United Arab Emirates. He's known as Sheikh Zayed al Nahyan. He lived there. So you can see that the kind of urban form was quite sparse. Today, this is what it looks like. Cars on either side. Often there's 10 lanes, five going one way, five going the opposite way. Buildings galore. I'm standing on top of a 55 floor building here. And this is what I could see. They're buildings that range from 11 floors to 55, 60 floors. And they're buildings that represent the typical building stock of Abu Dhabi. 
So I asked you a quick question about what comfort meant. And comfort, in so many ways, is the way that you experience an environment. And so as academics, we have tried to quantify what you experience as comfortable by a scale. This scale, the thermal sensation scale, was designed primarily to test how people feel comfortable by asking them a really, really simple question. What do you find comfortable? That is neutral. So zero on the scale is where you're neutrally comfortable. You're not warm or hot, and you're not cold or freezing. So when you're neutral, that is when we associate you to being completely comfortable. Now the real question lies, is this a good measure of how we feel comfortable? So if I ask you on a rather emotional day if you are comfortable, is your response going to be the same to me? If you've walked in on a, on a really hot day outside and the temperature is still really warm indoors, are you going to be as comfortable as you were, say, on a winter day? So what I'm trying to do is give you the different aspects of what comfort is. And this is the main measure by perception of what people feel they are comfortable with. So if we look at some of the more typical ways of understanding comfort, you can arrange your comfort according to your behavior, like the clothes that you're wearing, the clothes that I'm wearing, the kind of behavior in terms of how you move about, the way that you're sitting right now. It can tell me a lot of information about your body language, but it tells me much more about how comfortable you are. Some of you are wearing jumpers, some of you are wearing shirts, others are wearing quite slinky tops or shorts. So it really is a behavioral thing. But on the other aspect of it, it's a physiological thing. So it's a biological automated system is your body. And your human form describes the exact association that you have with the climate. So if I take you to Abu Dhabi, there are more chances that you will feel more comfortable in an Abu Dhabi climate. But if I were to take you to, say, Iceland or Norway, or if I were to take you to the North Pole, you would be very cold. And why is that? Because you've acclimatized. Acclimatization is when you have spent, let's say, six months in a place, and you have acclimatized to the climate there in this wherever you are. So when I first moved to India about a, a week ago, it was extremely hot for me. But now I've, I've started to acclimatize. I'm seeing less sweat beads on me. And you know I'm feeling more comfortable. I've changed my dress. I feel more comfortable with the clothes that I'm wearing. So what I really wanted to delineate for you was that you've got this metabolic response, which is natural, biological. And on the other hand, you've got a behavioral response, which is where you can change your activity, your dress. And these can be measured. Now, heat balance is measured by your metabolic rate, your clothing insulation, the air temperature, the radiant temperature. It looks at the speed of air. So for example, you could be sitting down rather hot. But if you have a fan, you've got a nice breeze that's coming. And so you're feeling a little bit more comfortable. But it's also the amount of moisture in the environment relative humidity. So what we try to do when we're measuring thermal comfort is to look at either a heat balance model, which analyzes comfort in terms of predictive mean vote, which I must say is a little dated. And the reason for that, it was designed in the 1970s, utilizing male um, occupants in a building, in a laboratory, with a very controlled environment. And these males were young, healthy individuals. The predictive mean vote goes back to your sensation scale, but it also has a very specific understanding and a, an equation that goes into much more depth of how people feel comfortable according to measured characteristics of the environment. And these are, for example, the previous um, factors like or variables like relative humidity and air temperature. And all of these go into that equation. You've also got something called the predictive percentage of dissatisfied individuals. So if we were to calculate how many people were neutrally comfortable in an environment, we start to scale exactly how much comfort there is in a percentage of people. Say, for example, in this room, you will look a little bit like, you know, maybe 80% comfortable. Maybe you could be 90% comfortable. 
So that normally means between 10 and, say, 20% dissatisfied individuals. But are you really going to be that dissatisfied? This measure, which is also part of the heat balance model, is to, to capture how comfortable people are and how uncomfortable they are. Adaptive comfort is the opposite view. Where you have heat balance models, you have a theory that has started in the States and has also moved on to the UK, which looks at how we adapt and how we adapt by perhaps the way that we open a window when we're a little bit hot inside or change your clothes and how your behavior can change in an environment to make you more comfortable. So out of all of these, the thing that I find really difficult to digest is the ASHRAE standard 55 2010, which has now been updated to 2013. ASHRAE stands for the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers. And the issue that I have with this is that they have defined what steady state comfort means. So for example, every time you're in an environment which is, is not prescribed as, say, 21 degrees Celsius, between 30 and 50% relative humidity, you are in an unsteady environment. So let's say plus or minus two degrees Celsius, 19 degrees to 22, 23 degrees, and that relative humidity. And if you're out of this parameter with a steady state, you are theoretically uncomfortable, correct? What happens when you're uncomfortable or in an unsteady environment, which is most of the time when you're walking around these buildings are pretty wide open. They're not a set condition. I haven't experienced one measured continuous state of comfort when I'm walking around your buildings in set. But why is that? Because they have an unsteady environment. But why do we have to call it unsteady? Why can't they be called transitional? If you're in an environment and it is a set condition, then why is it that we have to call it an unsteady environment? So if you're transitioning, between one steady and another steady environment, surely we can measure that transitional environment. And this is what my PhD focuses on. It looks at these transitional spaces, which are theoretically uncomfortable, circulation spaces, entrance zones, lobby areas, corridors, all of these environments, indoors and outdoors, that can give you an understanding of what these transitional spaces are. And they are theoretically uncomfortable places. If you look at some of the examples of buildings in, say, Abu Dhabi with Foster's designed Mazda City, you'll see that the urban form actually gives you a completely different experience just by design. The design of these buildings you can associate to architectural concepts or urban plans, which start to question what kind of urban form can, can just by design make you more comfortable. And this is an example taken by Foster and Partners of the kind of research they did to understand what makes an urban environment more comfortable. So for example, the desert environment, you can see that the radiant temperature, felt temperature, is 67 degrees Celsius, the urban form, or in a very, very highly compacted environment where the thermal insulation is there, present, to make you feel a little bit more comfortable, let's say, with narrow walls, so that you do not, are not exposed to so much solar insulation, then you're looking at about 49 degrees in terms of radiant felt temperature. This is nighttime. So the temperature can drop, and it can encourage you to be completely in, in a completely different sense of what is theoretically comfortable. So I've challenged this. And I've questioned how people feel inside these unsteady environments, because they're still indoors, theoretically. These entrance lobbies, these reception areas, the lift lobbies, are still part of the measurements of what we feel comfortable, right? In Mazda, they've used design to help them to channel wind through the, the actual urban form. They've utilized this concept of microclimate analysis so that over time and over spaces, you can actually reduce the amount of temperature that you're experiencing. Let's say we take the example of the radiant temperature of the desert environment of 67 degrees Celsius. We bring it into urban form. Just by shading, you can reduce that dramatically. And that's what we need to be concentrating on. What kind of devices can we use to create more comfortable environments? Is it orientation of the buildings? Is it 
say, the, the angling of the building. So, for example, in the southern hemisphere, that's where you get the most amount of solar gain into the building. So these heat gains can impact the amount of ventilation that you design for the building, or, or they can impact how much comfort you actually experience in terms of, of the environment that is indoors. But I think we need to go beyond what thermal comfort is and start looking at the thermal comfort in terms of energy use. And that energy use is really important. In terms of Abu Dhabi, that's where we're seeing an increase in air conditioning spaces. If I go all the way back to the first photographs that you saw of Abu Dhabi and to that built form, that is causing a really big issue because all of the air conditioning devices are on top of the building. So they're creating almost like a cloud around the building. We call that an urban heat island effect. And so you've got this balloon that is surrounding, like a crystal maze that surrounds the building, but it surrounds the city, and it gets warmer and warmer. So you end up using more air conditioning to cool your building down. So what I've tried to do is I've utilized all of the Abu Dhabi government's energy consumption data, metered by floor, metered by buildings, metered by tenants, and I've tried to analyze exactly how much electricity is being utilized in the different zones in Abu Dhabi. So in the bottom left, you can see the Abu Dhabi island and where you've got red or you've got green. These are a little scale that I've got that shows you for 2010 where and what electricity is being used and what it's being used for. So what we're trying to do is start mapping out, analyzing the benchmarking all of the electricity consumption in Abu Dhabi, but also associating that to something a little bit more visible. So if you were to put a green box of the amount of CO2 emissions equivalent on these uh, kilowatt hour consumption, what will you find? And that is what you have on the right. Um, it's where we started to play with visualizing that data so that the building owners can actually understand what's happening inside their buildings. During my research, I wanted to understand what people were feeling inside these transitional spaces. So these thermal comfort meters collect air velocity, radiant temperature, um, wet bulb, and dry bulb temperature. And at the same time, in these transitional spaces, I was standing there taking set point temperatures and also asking lots of questions. This is me with very short hair, my god asking questions that were really simple. For example, going back to your thermal sens sensation scale, but also asking them if their behavior had changed as soon as they walked into the building. If you're walking from 50 degrees Celsius into 21 degrees Celsius, surely that's gonna have an impact on you. But I wanna ask you how you're being impacted from this one step change. And that step change, the, the less it is, the more comfortable you will be as you walk into the building. If there's a change of 30 degrees Celsius by the time you've walked just five meters, what kind of an impact can we measure from that? And if we can reduce it by urban design, what can we do? So this is a question for, for you later. These are some of the people that, that I developed a focus group with. I talked to them. I try to understand what it is about the building that they're experiencing. These are facility managers trying to understand what the occupants are experiencing. And this is all part of something called a post-occupancy evaluation. It was developed in the 1960s in the UK. And it's a, it's a method to try and build a whole feedback mechanism of buildings. So you design them. Let's say you're all architects. You've all designed a building. But when do we know that your building is actually making people feel comfortable. When do we know when your building has helped people be more productive in, in this room, let's say? How do we know that? The question can't be answered because we don't. We don't capture how comfortable people are in terms of the feedback of these occupants inside these buildings. We've designed all these wonderful places to live. We've created environments indoors to match the external environment. We've created really comfortable environments where people, humans, probably don't live. But what we fail to do is build a whole network, a benchmark even, of the amount that people feed back into this system of building design. But if we were to have that, what kind of a system would we have? This is a very big question. 
So that's the end of my presentation. I just wanted to give you an overview of the, of the analysis that I'm doing and the kind of questions that I'm asking. Um, as you can see on the board, you've got question, question, which means I'm really hoping for twice as many questions. Thank you very much. So go ahead. There's a question at the back. Okay, so uh, let's start with you. So how do you uh, plan, so based on individuals, the, you mentioned that the comfort levels would differ. I mean, with the same temperature, another person would not be feeling comfortable with the same humidity level. So, how do you plan to capture this? Uh, is, it, is, it better, is it in the scope of your study? And if it is, how do you plan? So, I've taken all of the measured characteristics of the environment, so your temperature, relative humidity, etc. But at the point at which I'm asking that question, are you comfortable? Generally, in post occupancy evaluation, the bus survey, which is a building and use survey that is used across the board, is one that um, gives a survey out to people, asks them within two weeks to come back to them and tell them how their building is performing. But my point is that you need to ask them in situ, as soon as they've experienced this space, of whether they feel comfortable. So my perception scale is identical to the com comfort vote, which is your thermal sensation scale. Neutrality, where I'm asking them if they're more comfortable or less. But what I'm doing is I'm asking them in an unsteady environment. So I'm utilizing the same method for asking them, but I'm, I'm trying to find out what kind of results will show me that people are actually more comfortable or not. At the end of the day, it's what your word is against somebody else. But it's that fact that I don't know what the X factor is that I'm trying to get at. So I'm really hoping that my data will show me if one person is comfortable and say they're male, and one person is uncomfortable and say they're female, but they have different measurements, let's say, their uh, metabolic activity was really high when they walked into the environment, or one of them, let's say, was wearing shorts and t-shirts and the other was wearing like a full abaya. Does that have an impact on the way that we are comfortable? And my results show that metabolic activity has a huge impact on how we, how we feel comfortable. So depending on the actual temperature indoors, and remember that I've got an actual uh, list of characteristics of that moment in time with the thermal comfort meter, I can tell you exactly what the temperature was at the moment that I was asking these questions. So the aim is to try and get the exact characteristics of the building. This is a real building, this is not a laboratory. You know, I can't just set the temperature to 21 degrees Celsius. What I'm experiencing on this stage is slightly different to what you're experiencing at the back. It's a different environment. So we should really ask the questions of people when they're in situ. I hope that answers. No, it doesn't. Okay. <laughs> Yes, uh, but uh, for example, if, uh, for example, I mean, is your, is, would, would your study be uh, uh, detailed enough to capture, like, for example, I've noticed, like, uh, for a person having higher fat percentage or a lesser fat percentage than me, would be experiencing a different uh, comfort, would be having a different comfort with the environment. So, since since this, these things matter, if your study would have been open, I mean, it, it would, if it would have backward and forward uh, continuity to the data that you are capturing. For example, uh, if you are also capturing this aspect of somehow you have the ability to capture the metabolic rate or the fat percentages or I don't know, high water. So I started doing that. I take, I've taken all of the details of the buildings. So the other thing that I didn't mention was that I've taken the electricity consumption of, say, a month in, in August 2011, interviewed people then, and also interviewed them in 2012 in August. And the aim was to increase the temperature by one degree to see if, within the transitional spaces, they were more comfortable with this increase in temperature. The metabolic factors are observed. But you can go into much more detail on the biological factors like the percentage of fat, or you can have something called the personal heat stress monitor, which has got a very small diode that fits into your ear. And as I walked people around the building, the, the alarm went off on the actual machine, and I couldn't use it. When I started to download the data, it was showing me that people were way too uncomfortable in terms of the thermal sensation scales to actually predict any kind of comfort. 
So I couldn't use that data, unfortunately, because the machine died on me. Or maybe people were just too hot, and we just don't know that. But I think you can do all sorts of assessments on a biological scale to give you much more information about, for example, your weight, uh, characteristics of your heart rate, um, your impact of a particular environment. It could be even your cortisol levels, so your stress levels. There's a great study you should check out at the Center of Advanced Spatial Analysis where one of the students is looking at the impact of an urban form on the psychology of a person. So he's taken maps of the brain and he's walked people through Totten Court Road in London. And what he's trying to do with these EEGs is to try and map out the interaction between space and human. And it's actually quite striking that in some places in London, people are showing higher levels of stress. And I think this sort of biological, more medical side of, of urban uh, post-occupancy evaluation could be really intriguing. Yes, at the back over there. The data you are collecting is, a, is at a very micro scale. How do you actually scale it up to a city level when you talk about urban design? So I've taken 20 buildings worth of data and they're all scattered over the island of Abu Dhabi. Of course, I've had access to 36,000 buildings worth of energy data, but a lot of that information about the building, including the correct um, indoor footprint, is not accurate, so I can't really use it. So it's a case of one step at a time trying to figure out, okay, so if we were to map out these buildings, what are the challenges that we faced? I faced a lot of real challenges. I mean, you know, imagine going into a building and, and telling a facilities manager, I want to evaluate your buildings. Are they going to allow you to do that? The biggest challenge is trying to get into a building and actually download real data about the building. So that's your first challenge. And then when you go further into actually mapping out the environment, you know, taking meteorological data of, of the airport, which is 50 kilometers away, is not really representative of exactly outside of your building. So I think we need the, the kind of sensing technology on a smarter level inside the building, like smart metering, but we also need to actually map out the environment. So I think it's probably another thesis. Maybe. <laughs> Other questions? Yes, at the front. So I've got two answers for you. The first one, is um, I took the poll rating system qualification, and that is the BRIAM and LEED equivalent for the Gulf. Um, what I find with this is that it, it's using real buildings, but I think we need to be a little bit more specific about the kinds of buildings that we have. And I don't think that um, the kind of analysis and the research that has been utilized to design that system is as local as it can be. It's a sort of international benchmarking but international doesn't mean local, it's not representative. So I think with, with the Pearl rating system, my challenge was to actually understand the urban form. Now what I've realized with my company, Kinsara Hackney Limited, is that when you design a building, there's only a certain amount that you can do to modify it once it's been built. In fact, a lot of the buildings that we have today, 90% of which will still be standing by the year 2050. But what do we do about these buildings that have already been built? So the big question is, what kind of changes can, can impact? And I think with the, the kind of design, if I go all the way back to this, the sort of mapping out of these buildings inside, is to figure out which are these transitional environments? What kind of microclimate can you change? What kind of shading can you attach on the external facades of the building? What kind of impact can you have by um, let's say more agricultural sort of shading outside so that it impacts the way that you feel comfortable. Perhaps there's certain mechanical changes that you can make, but it becomes really complicated when you've got a perfectly airtight building. Of course, you've got infiltration coming into the building. They're like holes inside the building where all the, the air from inside just comes in. So all the calculations that you do for what is theoretically comfortable starts to play different measures as soon as you put occupants inside the building. Uh, there was this joke that somebody once said to me that a building is perfect 
unless if you tell <laughs> exactly so a building is perfect but as soon as you, s you start to put occupants inside it they start opening the window the air conditioning's going they start you know opening the front door things start changing so it's really about understanding how your building is operating and then from that figuring out what kind of tweaks you can do to the building. So perhaps there's certain you know, understanding of the depth of the thermal insulation of the actual walls, the U values, the R values, figuring out what, what really does work. If I go back to some of the buildings in Mazdar City, they've really tried, they've really tried, I mean, in Abu Dhabi, where, where is the shading here? A lot of the buildings have such high glazing that you know, it's bound to be extremely hot inside, and so your rate of um, your chiller use is, is going up quite high. I think there are a number of things that can happen. Um, and if you look at some of the old buildings in, say, Aleppo in Syria, um, you can, I mean, when I was walking through the streets of Aleppo, this is a long while back, in about 2010, um, Adli Kudsi, the architect that had, uh, in 1984, helped to make Aleppo a World Heritage Site, was walking me through the city, and it was just this extremely narrow streets that were shaded purely by design. And I think there are some concepts that we can take from examples like Mazda, where we can understand how to design this kind of urban environment to be comfortable just without using any kind of cooling. And then part of it becomes behavioral. Any other questions? Yes, at the back. Can your data be interpreted to an urban heat island? As can it be a usable data for the urban heat island? Twenty buildings out of thirty-six thousand, probably not. But if you were to to use the the data that I've collected, especially from out outside of the buildings, I mean that's something that maybe if you're interested in, we can have a look at. I think for a microclimate analysis of urban heat island, you need meteorological data, and it needs to be very well mapped out. But there are some examples in Abu Dhabi where Mazda University um, has actually collected that kind of data and actually figured out that um, where you've got the mangroves area in Abu Dhabi, it's actually a lot cooler than it is where you don't have any kind of natural resource. predictive mean vote, which is really used for steady state environments. This is really utilizing your kind of clothing factor, which is behavioral. It is looking at measured temperature. Um, it is looking at measured radiant temperature, relative humidity. It's looking at your insulation or clothing insulation, metabolic activity, I've mentioned that. So you do get the sort of measured characteristics. But I think when you're talking about temporal and when you're looking at uh, perception, this is really, I can only ask you how you feel. I can't go inside your body and, and really determine these characteristics unless if I'm going into maybe much more depth on the biological side. So it fits because there is, I think, a necessity to understand the performance of buildings in terms of their you know, energy efficiency, but also how people feel inside these buildings. So perception of these buildings according to the way that they are, their environmental par parameters are being collected. I think the aim is to see what people actually really think of these buildings. And that's where I've asked more questions and delved into an interview style with them to figure out, you know, you say that you're comfortable um, and, you know, perhaps another person may not be, what is it that makes you feel more comfortable? What kind of behavioral changes have you noticed as soon as you walked inside the, bu the building? Are you, let's say, a national of the country or are you uh, a non-national person? Does 
um, your nationality have anything to do with it? Does your gender have anything to do with it? Does your um, amount of experience inside the building have anything to do with it? Just because you've just walked in, is your perception of the building going to be different to somebody who has been inside this building for like three years? For example, in some of the survey questions we've asked, is this building an, an iconic building to you? Like, does, what does the design of the building impact on your image of, of what the spatial characteristics are or any of these kind of questions? So that if you want to have a look at the bus survey, there are a lot of questions that delve into much more analysis. So it asks people about their health. Has your health been impact? Your productivity. Would you say that your productivity has increased, decreased of a, of a factor of plus or minus 40%? So I think there is a, there is a lot that can still be done inside this, this area of, of building and occupant satisfaction. Yes, at the front. I wanted to know if your study is actually aiming to apply ergonomics in a, by designing buildings to minimize the physical or psychological discomfort of occupants. Like, is it similar to ergonomical changes like in a workplace or a uh, working environment, but at a larger scale, like at a building level? At the minute, with my research, I'm trying to understand what these buildings are like. So what I'd like to understand later after my research is kind of complete is to figure out what kind of design changes we can actually implement it through the company or whatever else. Ergonomics is such a fascinating topic and I find that having sat on my desk more than 12 hours a day that I've become an expert on how I'm comfortable in an environment looking at my TV screen when I'm working, right? So on a very basic level, the, the actual characteristics of my physiology are really important inside, let's say, on it, sitting at my desk. But what happens when you start to extract that information on an actual building level? So for example, the amount of, well, let's say this is health-based as well. Is your building a healthy building? We look at some buildings being sick, like sick building syndrome, where you can be impacted by the number of air changes inside the room. I mean, some of the questions that I asked were, is this, if this is a comfortable environment, tell me what kind of comforts there are, or uncomforts that there are. So if you're dissatisfied, tell me more about it. That I remember there was um, a woman inside one of the, the really prestigious buildings in Abu Dhabi. She had, you know, a, she was sitting with a blanket around and she said, I'm really cold here. And I said, what, why, why are you this cold? And she said, why don't you come over here and have a, an experience of it? So just going behind the reception counter, there was something called um, a supply of air conditioning right above her. And so it was really uncomfortable for me to be standing there and to also experience what she was experiencing, but she has to stand there. I don't, I've got a choice, she doesn't. What was happening inside these buildings was that, let's say place is designed a specific manner, and then you come in as a tenant and you wanna halve the space. What ends up happening when these buildings are designed is the whole, like the air tightness, for example, all of it's mapped out. So a lot of that can't be shifted and changed according to the kind of fit out as people come in and out of the building as tenants when they're renting space. So for example, you can have a supply of cool air here and a return of the air in the same room. Let's, let's use this space here. The issue starts to become, if we were to split this in half and everybody here on my left were in a space that was being cooled and everybody here on my right was in a space where the temperature was going in thinking, right, your radiant temperature is really increasing the temperature inside this space and you are freezing. Let's say you guys start complaining and telling the facilities manager, what are you doing? Have you turned the air conditioning off? No, sir, it's on. Ah, well, can you turn it a little bit cooler because we're boiling over here? They're gonna turn it up, right? So the air conditioning is gonna go full blast and these people on my left are gonna be screaming their heads off, calling the facilities management saying, what's wrong with you? Can't you tell that we're cold? So the design of the building is not ready to be implemented to change and adapt according to what people want and how they start using buildings. And I think we're one step into understanding what people are doing, but I think we need to take more steps into the ergonomics of buildings. There's a question at the back. Did you look at the, the fact that how much time is spent in this case before you interviewed them? 
Yes. So you mean when I'm interviewing them specifically or generally when people interview? So when they've walked into the building, it's upon entry. It's immediate. So it's less than two minutes as they've been in this space. Can you tell me how long it takes for a body to adapt to an environment? Nobody else does either. There are, there's research, Richard de Deere has done some research on the 20 minutes that it takes to acclimatize, or for example, ASHRAE standards of, it takes about an hour to acclimatize, but is there something specific that we can use to say that this is a steady environment? I think it's, it's almost like a perceptual change, right? We were talking about the, uh, I don't know, the percentage of fat in a person is gonna be different. So already your interaction with your environment depends on these biological characteristics as well. I think that is open to discussion and I think a lot more research needs to take place before we can actually say for definite that at 30 minutes you have definitely acclimatized. I think we can say by safe standard that if you spent like an hour inside the building or more than 30 minutes you will have acclimatized to an environment. But it's tough to say that. Let's say you're in your, in your classroom and you're nice and comfortable and somebody's just walked into the building really hot, turns the air conditioner on and says, oh, I'm, f you know, I'm boiling, I need, I need to cool down. Is it fair for that person to turn up the air conditioning? No, the, I think the point that I'm trying to make is that while we might not, a, might, we might not have the minimum time that you can be for comfort, you can definitely have that beyond this, people would be comfortable, I mean, people would be able to understand if the environment is comfortable or not. Right, if you are just entering, then obviously it's, it's, it's not that your body is not in equilibrium in that, in that environment. So my, my point is that... It's a really good question. I mean, how long does it take for your body to, to, or, to meet that equilibrium? Or, or is the, should the interview be taken after an hour that people are inside to understand exactly whether the comfort level has been achieved or not? But that's the whole point of my research, to actually understand what people are feeling upon their entry. We have research in steady state environments, and all these buildings are designed by these steady state environments. But if you look at some of the buildings, 20, 30% of this building is classified unsteady. So what about these, these areas inside the building? Right, we had a question in the front. <laughs> That's the question. If we were to increase, should it be transitional spaces, basically transitional spaces, and we expect these transitional spaces to be preferred, probably it's too much because they are supposed to be transitional spaces, and there is number one. Number two, the methods and the parameters which you are measuring are primarily meant for a stable state of mind to measure. Uh, MRT or even RT and looking at PMD, PPD or even adaptive one may not be a correct method to look at the transitional space. So probably uh, even instrumentation, I haven't seen any growth literature when it's stabilized in two minutes. Uh, so instrumentation also requires 10 minutes of stabilization time right before you start the MRT. So how do you really so with your first question of the transitional space of whether this can actually associate, is, it, is there any point in actually calculating the comfort of people? I believe that all of the, and it's a really good question and it does, it starts to delve into the way that buildings are designed. Why is it that we're allowing occupants to experience uncomfort before comfort? Is there a point of transition through which you are readied, prepared, before you go into a space of comfort? So this is just a question, no expectation there, of whether people actually are or not. This is just a question that I've asked them upon their entry. And for your second question of PMV, 
actually there's only one paper that suggests that transitional spaces can use PMV. Every single other paper on transitional spaces is saying that you cannot use PMV because it is a steady state comfort method, right? So my aim in utilizing PMV is actually to show, according to Adrian Pitts in Hud University of Huddersfield, who has mapped out if we were to increase the PMV from, say, 0 0.5, minus 0 0.5 to plus 0.5, and that is, say, you know, your whatever percentage of, of people dissatisfied. If you were to increase that, what would the results show? And so far, nobody has done research on this, and this is what, my, this is what makes my research unique, that if we were to increase the temperature set points, what kind of an impact would that have on people and their comfort? So by measuring, measuring this sort of uh, kind of um, flexible set points, is there a way that we can understand PMV's association to unsteady environments? The second point of your question, and you're right, it does take some time for the um, globe temperature to readjust, and the, the QT36 machines that I've utilized do take some time, and it's shown in all of the data uh, points that they can vary. I mean, the air velocity can change within a second. How do you quickly map that out? So you can get, um, I think, up to like um, a one-minute a one minute um, calculation in the actual uh, point uh, measurement. And in doing that, what I've done is I've taken the mean of the time that they were there with me. So I've measured, okay, so I'm, I'm questioning this person at this time, and then I've finished questioning them at this time. So I'm trying to map out the average sort of environment that they're in. Of course, you know, an environment can change as, as quick as you and I can just walk outside and then you're in a different environment. So it really is trying to, to use these mapping skills to understand how people are experiencing the environment. Later, longer discussion. Ha. Yes. Something that we've done up until now, it's a really good question, something that we've done up until now is to create airlocks. So as soon as you walk into the building, lock of air, then you walk into the building, right? So you kind of have a space to prepare. Now, these airlocks, let's say in the UK, have got um, almost like a heat curtain. So it's to give you kind of like a curtain to stop any of the heat coming outside. And on the opposite side, you'd have like a cool curtain so that you could walk into the building. Now, it's quite difficult to understand what kind of parameters should you experience as you're entering the building. So we've got an understanding of a steady state, kind of like a box or an office that you're going to, that's your destination. Your first question was, you know, how long are people really gonna spend more than 15 minutes in a reception area? Perhaps the person who's, who's working behind the reception counter may, you know, spend nine hours a day there. Whereas you might just walk straight into the building, go to the lift lobby up to the 24th floor and go into your floor and sit down, do your work. So this journey that you take into the building, what kind of changes have occurred in your body 
as you've experienced the building transitioning through to the steady state. So one of my, um, my aims was to analyze this by utilizing the personal heat, heat stress monitor. So to take people around the building so that they have five minutes of the external environment, then to walk them through the building to understand how that changes, then to sit them down and to give them a questionnaire to fill out. So I did that with 50 people. And unfortunately, the heat stress monitor data was corrupt. But what was really interesting is to see how these people had experienced the external environment as they walked in with temperature thermometers and things like that to experience their, you know, their understanding and their response to these buildings. I think we need to understand what transitional spaces are and on a practical level, how can these spaces be better designed to reduce that shock like you talk about, right? If you're walking in from 50 degrees to 20 degrees Celsius, but it's an immediate 20 degrees Celsius. Do you know that some of the, the rooms need to be chilled at, 20, uh, at 12 degrees Celsius to get a mean 25 degrees Celsius, right? So it really does. And I think that optimization by increasing the temperature inside, increasing the set point temperature inside the building is going to reduce your electricity consumption, right? Or energy use, but it's about mapping out. Okay, so if we tweak this, like cooling degree, days that's to understand how many hours let's say there is like a base temperature that you don't have to do anything to the building to keep it cool but say your base temperature is like eight degrees celsius and on an average the the mean external environment the temperature is say 35 degrees celsius so majority of the time your building is out of its own comfort and so you're trying to map out how much cooling you'd require to keep that internal environment comfortable. And I think these are really big questions. And there, there are a multitude of aspects that need to come into this, like the actual architectural design, the efficiency of the chillers, the, the kind of mapping of the steps, that you, like the, almost like the step changes that you experience as you're going into steady state environments. And this is just the beginning of the research into that. Yes, question at the front. Go ahead. This is, it's going into more of the coefficients of performance of air conditioning engineering, uh, for which I'm not an expert, um, but slowly understanding that there are so many different things, so many different expertise um, that, that are involved in the design of a building. And the air conditioning is, is something, like, I mean, just mapping out real buildings once you've designed them, it's shocking just to map out by either um, dynamic simulation modeling using Energy Plus or Symergy, any of these devices, you start, you, these are still estimates, you know, to understand exactly what your building is doing and all the exact heat gain is thousands of calculations. It is a very complicated science, but it's a necessary science if we want to map out what these buildings are doing. I think this is a big area of which I'm not qualified to answer. Yeah, so one of the things that I captured was how much time do you spend outside of air conditioning before you walk into the building? And I've only taken, is it you know, up to 15 minutes? Is it up to 30 or is it up to an hour? And it is to measure their um, metabolic activity as they walk into the building. But 
if you were to analyze the metabolic activity throughout that duration, if they're driving a car um, or if they're running to the building, I think these are big factors that can Im affect the way that you experience the building. It's like, what do you perceive this building is going to do to you? I, I was really intrigued by how most of the users use that building. Some buildings are like just It's like what is really external and what is really steady state. But all the ones in between are kind of a big question mark, aren't they? So for example, you've got, okay, we've got a defined steady state if it comes and falls into these parameters. And you've got the definite outdoors. I mean, is the outdoors, you know, the, the, the desert? Is that the outdoors? Um, so the big question lies on, on how do you map out the different changes of, of the exposure that you have to these environments. And I think as, as architects or urban planners, I think the real excitement is in designing the experience of people inside buildings. I remember when I watched this incredible video, which I recommend you watch, it's called, How Much Does Your Building Weigh, Mr. Foster? And I remember I was at the opening ceremony with Norman Foster and he, you know, his wife had videoed some of his buildings, like the, the library in Berlin, the kind of movement of, of, of these buildings, how people would move around the building is designed, right? That's kind of the place of, of, of an architect to design your experience. And it's only then when I realized that I could actually have feeling inside a building. I remember when I used to go to the British Library and I'd sit there and feel, you know, I can study here. I can study really well here. How come I can't study over there? Why is it that I can't study over here? But I can really study here. So is it um, lux? Is it luminescence on the desk? Is it the relative humidity? I mean, we're all different. But if we were to understand at a, a little bit more of a detailed level, you know, how we feel and how we respond. I mean, I know people who have suffered from mood and depression primarily because of the lighting inside their room. And this is a whole science, you know? I mean, uh, speaking to an expert in Abu Dhabi, we had a, like a three hour discussion of what lighting actually means. How do you light an environment to make people psychologically comfortable or productive at a desk? That is defined. But what's really intriguing is there is, I think it's all open to interpretation when it comes to you know, mapping out the experiences as you enter this building. And hopefully we can get more people intrigued by sort of preparing them. Like if you were to go to an Italian beautiful building and you're walking up the stairs, psychologically as you look up, it's almost like a foresight thing, right? So it forces you to think you know, highly of a building as you're walking up it. But what happens if you walk down a building? Are many entrances going down? That you would look down and almost kind of like introvert, extrovert, introvert. There's, it's such a fascinating topic. Very cool question. So I think that's all we have time for. I think it's uh, time for Chai Pani. Hello.